Hi everyone and welcome to the real-time coloring video for this cute Santa called Waving Santa by Make It Crafty. He is a digital stamp so I have printed him on the black and white setting on my Canon Pixma uh, onto some Make It Colorful blending cardstock and I'm going to use my Copics to color him in. If you want to see me making the card or if you want to see this coloring in a sped up fashion, I do have the card making video and it will be linked in down below and up in the right corner. But let's uh, jump into the coloring. So uh, I actually really liked the way, the outcome of uh, this uh, character. Uh, sometimes uh, my coloring, it's okay but I don't really love the coloring. In this case, I actually really, really like how it came out with all the textures and the dimension. And um, it's images like this that really keeps me pushing myself to learn how to color better and how to color more. Um, so uh, in this case, I started with my absolute lightest color and I added in all the shadows or the, and also I added a little bit of light because I added those little lines where the cheek were and that is where I'm gonna have a highlight however I knew that I wanted to have that cheek um, line to be able to make the eyes so that is why I went in with the lightest color there even though I usually try not to go over my highlights more than once because then you can really get that like deep dark shadows towards very light hi highlights as Copics are transparent and uh, the more layers you layer a color the darker the color will be because the um, it is an alcohol marker so the uh, kind of solution that the pigment is lying in is alcohol which also helps the pigment to kind of glide into the paper but also um, it will disappear so it will only be the pigment left so every time you color on top of something uh, again and again and again you will lay down more and more pigment and therefore the color will get darker and darker but yeah so um, in this case I did do my highlights though because that was where I wanted the um, I wanted to have that definition to know where to put the rest of the colors for the eyes for the eyes, I haven't made perfectly round irises uh, because both his eyebrows and that little dint in the cheek will kind of hide the top and the bottom of the eye. So I'm just doing the, the sides of the pupil. And then I added in some um, B60 colors for the whites just to give a little bit of a shadow to the eye whites. Um, and that was kind of how I, I built up the eyes. And then I went in with the E04, which is the darkish shadow. Um, I used it very, very sparingly. And then I used the E11 to kind of push down the uh, darkest of the colors down into the paper. So it looks a little bit lighter. And that way I get just the amount of um, shadows that I wanted. I, I personally feel that the E04 just raw is a little bit too much contrast the way I color. So that is why I'm, I'm being very, very careful of kind of trying to push it down with the E11 to get it a little bit lighter than it um, is otherwise. Uh, I wanted to take this time and talk about kind of different ways of coloring because when you're watching videos like mine, I try to, in different ways, teach how I color. Uh, I have a very specific aesthetic. I have a way of coloring that I really like, and that is why I'm coloring it. I still do believe that I can build myself and learn a lot, but I also think that um, a lot of that learning means practicing and using references to kind of get a bigger library of different textures and techniques and figuring out how to do stuff uh, but what the way I do it I do it with a very specific aesthetic in mind and I think that is very important if you are one that doesn't like my aesthetic 
you want to learn how to do Copics, but you don't like my aesthetics, there is a lot of other teachers out there that does other kind of aesthetics. Um, and I would go look for that kind of aesthetic and try to mimic that and then learn that way because that was how I learned. When I started coloring, which now is quite some time ago, um, I started making cards in 2009. So it's 10 years ago since I started, but I didn't start doing copy coloring until like 2012, 2013, somewhere there. Uh, I had some very, very good teachers. Um, and those were among people, Zoe. Uh, Zoe is the owner of Make It Crafty, who makes these beautiful digital stamps. And she has both, she has a whole bunch of ebooks, and her latest ebooks are coming with video tutorials. You can also find video tutorials. She has a bunch of them uh, on her website. I will link everything in the description down below. I learned a lot from Zoe, like a lot, lot from Zoe. She's really, really talented, and she had the aesthetic that I was looking for, the way I wanted to color, the way I wanted my images to look like. Uh, but I also studied other colorists to learn how they did it, kind of looking at their uh, designs, how they did it. Um, and I think my top three, after Zoe, of course, is Jennifer Dove. She is super talented. She even has her own like boot camp, Copic boot camp that you can go to in Arizona, Phoenix, Arizona. I'm hoping that one day I will afford to take the whole trip over to Phoenix, Arizona and do that. But I live in Sweden and um, it's quite expensive and I need to be able to afford that on top of my usual vacations because I don't think Christopher wants to go to Phoenix, Arizona to do coloring. By the way, Christopher is my, my boyfriend. But yeah, um, so uh, she's super, super talented. Uh, you can find her work both on her website, but also over in the Passionate uh, Paper Creations group uh, over on Facebook, where she and the next person on my list, which is Rhea Wayland, I think that's how she pronounces her uh, last name, uh, which also is a super talented Copic uh, colorist. She does a lot of flowers. Uh, that is one of her things. Um, but I learned a lot uh, from her also by studying what she does. Um, and then we have uh, one on my dear. Okay, this list can be so much longer. But one one of my big dear people that I, I just love her creations. And that is Faye Wynne-Jones. Um, you can find her in the Copic UK official group over on Facebook but I will try to find links to all of their blogs and everything and put it in the description down below. There is some honorable mentions. We have Barbara who owns um, Little Little Miss Muffet stamps um, which uh, where I got a lot of digital stamps. She does wonderful wonderful creations. Oh we have Steven Oh, he, definitely going to link everything he does, like his Instagram and stuff down below. He is super talented Canadian guy. I just love everything he does with Copics. Um, he's one of those that I have kind of fallen in love later in my coloring, coloring a journey. Um, he's awesome. Uh, but yeah, I, I have so many more uh, I could tell you about. But uh, let's get back into the coloring. But first, um, just as I mentioned again, if the, all those people have very similar aesthetic to what I have, they all have creations or have the kind of shading, the kind of coloring, the choice of color that I choose. If you actually not liking what I'm creating, then there's nothing that will stop you from, first of all, turning this video down. Uh, but uh, going and looking for those creators you know that you really, really like. Um, and if they are not making YouTube videos, they're probably someone out there that are making YouTube videos with those kind of creations. But yeah, so let's jump back into the coloring and kind of talk about 
everything that has happened so far. So yeah, I did his moustache and his beard and his eyebrows. And when I did that, I was very... I wanted to give him a hairy texture. I wanted the them to be very stripy because that is how beard looks. Um, I try not to do too much strands and more kind of concentrate on making groupings. However, I did make it a little bit more stripy and strandy. And when I do that, I'm using a flicking technique. Flicking technique is when you start off with your pen in the paper and then carefully just pull it up and forward at one same time and you will get these lines that have really 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 thin pointy ends that is flicking um, and it takes time to learn that is one of one technique that you really need to practice uh, if you want to learn how to do it is flicking because as you do it you will learn how to hold your pen uh, with a lighter touch because flicking needs you to not have a he heavy hand. If you have a heavy hand, flicking is very, very, very hard uh, because then you will have your nip too hard into the paper to be able to make those really, really, really thin lines. But yeah, I love flicking. I know that Zoe takes a pen and does flicking when she does other things. So she has a pen doing flicking. And, and then just doing other things. So yeah, um, that's the, that's one, one thing. For his um, kind of cuffs on his jacket and the little ball and the, the thing, it's called the brim of his hat, I wanted to give him another texture, but I wanted to work with the same colors. I'm using the W grays. Um, I'm using the W Grays because they go a little bit vintagey, which I really, really love. I love the tone of vintagey, especially for Christmas. Vintage and Christmas is two of the things I love. So in this case, I went with the Grays. I use my double zeros, the one and the three, mostly for the reasons that my other ones were drying out. And then I left them on the shelf for a couple of months. And then I tried to make in the videos last here uh, in the middle of June. Um, and then I just had to go and buy the refills finally. But here I use those um, because I usually use the even ones and not the uneven. But I have the whole set. So I tried to use all of them. And in this case, I really, really like how it came out because it was light and fluffy the way I really wanted it. Uh, using the number four in this case might have gotten like using the even ones and using the zero the two and the four might have made it a little bit more gray than i wanted it to be and by the way you will also see how when we started here it can feel a little bit too much darkness on it but as we are coloring uh, you will see how a uh, because we're adding darker colors into this, uh, the contrast will actually lower in the lighter areas. It won't have that much of a contrast. Um, and also the reason why I'm coloring in the order I do um, is because I have a shaky hand and when my hand shakes, I have a tendency to pull one pen into another color and if I do that on a darker color I can get like pull the dark red or the dark brown into the white and that can ruin the whole piece because I have found it pretty hard to get rid of um, so I'd rather go from light to dark it's easier for me um, but one thing you can try is to to um, when you choose your color and you go through them and do if you do one color at a time as I do, um, you can uh, start with the dark colors and then go to the light and that might help you if you have a problem with getting too little contrast on your images for the lighter parts because when you're working on a white piece of paper you will automatically not add as much contrast as if you are working uh, with darker colors around it. 
It's just, it's just a habit you have. I have come to the position where I know about how much contrast I need like in the face and in the lighter parts to balance the darker colors and therefore I can do it. Um, I kind of I know that it kind of looks a little bit crazy sometimes with the with the contrast when I start with the light colors, but as I build up the colors for the other parts, it will kind of tone down. But if you um, are having a problem with feeling that you don't get the dimension you want in your pace, try starting with the darker uh, colors and go towards the lighter colors. So for the rest of this uh, image, I am going to use my um, E40s for all of the leather pieces including his bag so i know that leather is so heavy so heavy but i thought it would be a gorgeous color you could go in and kind of go for lighter e40s and then maybe use something um, like a terry cloth or something and a little bit of blender solution to actually texture the bag and get it to um, look like it is um, something more more fabricy but well in this case I decided to go with all of the dark colors and the first thing I did here was to try to build up shapes in the bag uh, I've colored this image before and one of the things the two things that I feel is hard with this image and um, which I tried to fix in this still not happy with the hat um, is the bag and the hat the bigger area you have to color especially with Copics it is harder because Copics blend good when they are wet they don't blend that good when they have dried and when you are working on bigger areas they will dry or the alcohol will vaporize and disappear and you will only have the pigment left and then it's harder to get them to blend so if you have a hard time blending um, I would recommend starting with smaller images make them work and then kind of gradually do bigger images and then I don't mean um, you can have very big images with a lot of details and have it easier to blend than if you use a small image with bigger areas of color. Um, so this, this was actually a little bit of a challenge for me, but I thought it was a great challenge to do. Um, and I'm working again with the E40s. I'm using E47, E44 and E43. And E43 is one of those colors that is hard to blend with the E44. They are very close in number, so you think that it would be easy, but it isn't. And E44 and E47 are actually very far away in color, and they are also a little bit harder to blend. And this is where you can use tip to tip or do multiple layers. And I mostly do multiple layers here. Other things that can make uh, blending hard is if you have dry markers. And when I say dry markers, they don't have to be so dry so you can't color. But when you have come to a point with those markers, they will be a little bit, um, a little bit dry. And then blending is super hard because the way, as I said, the way the color will blend is that you have the solution in the marker, which is the alcohol, and that will kind of make the uh, pigment move inside the alcohol and this is this is where you want a wet mark want to want to blend on a having it wet when you blend um, using the uh, blender marker in the bottom to wet the paper first will most likely not give you the result that you want just gonna throw that out there because what you do when you're coloring is that you will get different amounts of alcohol in different layers in the paper. When you color with a marker that had color, 
to see here, this marker is running out of ink and you can see that because I'm getting a little bit, it's harder to blend and I also get like a stripiness from the marker. I think I refilled it later on, but yeah. Um, and then it's harder to blend it out because it is a little bit dry. But the, you get the pigment, it will kind of lie in this uh, alcohol bubble. And when you do it with a marker, you have color. You can make it even because you see the different, you can, when it gets streaky, it means that you have more alcohol uh, in some places or deeper in the paper than other places. And the pigment won't equally lay itself out. But when you do that with a colorless marker, uh, you won't see that you have these different kind of layers. So if you then go on top of that with a darker marker, you won't get the evenness that you're after because the alcohol already will lie in different layers. So the pigment will kind of add in different layers also. Also, you can only get so many layers. You can only add so many pigments on with Copic markers until it starts to get sticky. And this is when the pigment can no longer go down into the paper. So it lays on top of the paper instead. Um, so therefore, I do recommend going from dark to light when you are coloring. But it's just my recommendation. And as I actually said in the beginning, uh, this is just my way of coloring. It's not the right way of coloring. It is a way of coloring. There is multiple ways of using markers. Um, there are multiple ways of doing designs and there's some thousands of different aesthetics of coloring with Copics. This is just one of them. The reason why I go from dark to light is that that means that my absolute lightest color will only have one layer, two if I go through the colors twice, but usually only have one layer. While if I would go from light to dark, I would need to blend out the darker pencil with the lighter pencil every step of the way. And that will end up having three to four layers of the lightest color after just one turn. Um, and um, that usually makes the images darker than you want them to. So that's, that's my reasoning behind it. But as you saw with the bag, I went over a couple of different times just to make those pens blend a little bit better and to build up the, the dimension to make it look like there are things in the bag, like it's making divots and such on the leather bag that he is carrying. Um, also the way I colored make it actually look like the fabric is a little bit thicker because you can't really see any, any details. Um, I then uh, gone over to start working on my red tones because it's red tones. I like red tones. I'm using R24, R37, R39 and R89 for all of the red tones. And that is my favorite combination. The tip on the R using the R24 as the lightest colors because it's um, the lightest true red that is there. I picked up from Sandy Alnock. She has a whole bunch of things out there. Um, we have similar aesthetic, uh, but not completely. Um, I like her aesthetic, but I like my technique. So we don't have the same technique when we are coloring. Um, for all the reds, uh, I went in with a lighter red as my first color because I wanted to map out all the shadows and going in with a lighter red makes it possible for me to uh, actually see if, okay, I was thinking the wrong way here. Uh, if I add a shadow with my lighter red that I realize that this will not look good. I just don't have to fill it in with my darkest color and no one will be the wiser. So if you are uncertain where to put or you think you know where you want to put the shadows, but you're uncertain that it is the right way for you to put the shadows, then 
use your lightest color, map out where every shadow is, and that way you will get kind of a visual way of seeing it. And then go on over with your darkest color only on the places that you found that this is where I want the shadows to be. When I have, uh, when I've mapped out everything, I'm going in and then I'm gonna go uh, fabric by fabric, piece by piece. Again, this is because you want to have a wet surface when you are blending. So you don't want to work over the whole image. I have done it in the past, in periods, mainly because editing out the pencil swaps takes so much time. I can, be, I can honestly say that in many of my coloring videos, when I'm going in, I'm doing it one color at a time, um, even over multiple things. It has been because it takes so much time to edit out all of the pen pencil switches. Um, but when I do a, a speed up, that is kind of necess a necessity, is to remove all of those swaps. And also, it would take a lot of time if you wanted to sit here and see every time I put on a cap and then remove a cap and then put on a cap. It's actually quite a nice sound, that cap capping and uncapping. I'm going in here with my colorless blender to remove wherever I accidentally pulled the red. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm making small circles and trying to push the red towards the edge of the red. Um, and that is why how I kind of fixes some of my mistakes. And then I'm taking a second turn on the hat, kind of adding some shadows where I felt it needed to have shadows. Um, still not 100% happy with the hat. However, it turned out okay. So, yeah. And you can only do so many layers and you, it's very, very hard to lighten up something. So um, I let it be and then just continued on with the rest of my little Santa. When I'm doing shadows, in this case, you can see very, very clearly how, what I'm thinking when I'm doing shadows. One is you do the drop shadow and the drop shadow is a shadow that, or a cost a shadow, is a shadow that is cast by another object on top of the object. So in this case, I'm going around, I'm having cast shadows uh, underneath the cuffs, I'm having cast shadows underneath the beard, underneath the bag, uh, one of the arms is casting a shadow, stuff like that. Um, then I have rounded shadows. A rounded shadow is a shadow that is facing away from the light source. So it's basically to create the illusion that the object have a dimension, a circular dimension. I also add small, teeny, tiny lights called rim lights. And I, I do them uh, wherever I have, usually have a drop shadow or no, a rounded shadow. I add a one of those rim lights. Um, I'm doing it for a couple of reasons. One is that you do have a reflective light that can actually create one of those shadows. However, if you want to be really true, you should kind of figure out what kind of um, other colors there are around and make that reflective shadow have a tint of, or a reflective light have a tint of that light or that, or, or of the, uh, things around. So basically, if I put the Santa into a forest, um, the reflective light would have a green green tint. But uh, I do the rim light because it is a way to delimit the colors in between each other and make it look a little bit more dimensional and removing like blobs of color, making a definition between them. I do this more uh, when it comes to doing the no line coloring technique, because then I don't have the dark lines as the limiters. But I do use this when I work uh, on 
colors that are really really dark where the black line actually wouldn't give that delimiter that I really really need. As for the limit delimit between the red and the brown here, I really really needed to have that rim light to get those different parts kind of separated. That is that is why I did it all. Um, but yeah, um, I do with the ending of this. I am adding the R twenty four as my top layer which means I'm going over all of the area that is supposed to be red with the 24 and the reason of that is to make it look a little bit more cohesive. The other reds that I'm using have a very blue tint and if I only would go over the lightest parts of this um, it might not look well blended and it might kind of stand out. So what I'm doing, I'm going over, especially for these red combination, it is making it much more cohesive and giving it a much, much deeper red. If you just go over all of the areas to get that little bit of yellow that exists in the R24 that doesn't exist in the R30s. But yeah, that was all of the coloring that I did today. I hope you liked this video. If you do, please thumbs it up. If you know someone that might want to see this, maybe take and share this. And if you want to see more videos like this, hit that subscribe button. And yeah, thank you so much for watching and I see you later. Bye.